grace, mercy, and peace to you from God, our Father, and from our Lord Jesus. Amen. Let's pray. Lord God, in vain did the builders build the house and the watchers watch over the city unless you build the house and unless you watch over the city. And so, Father, I will speak and we will all listen in vain unless your Holy Spirit comes, unless you build us up as a spiritual house, as the people of Christ, your own sons and daughters. And so in the name of Jesus, on his behalf, we ask that you would do this for us, that you'd send out the Spirit into our hearts to work faith, hope, and love. In the name of Jesus. Well, we'll be in Isaiah 40 today. Isaiah 40. So if you have a Bible, I'd encourage you to open up there. And we're just going to look at the first two verses where it says, Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. So each week when I prepare a sermon, I I always pray that God would show me or guide me in what he's saying to you, his people, right? And uh, I I always pray that. And and, and honestly, most of the time, I I, kind of have to operate just on, on faith that even if, you know, that God is just going to work through me reading and studying and, and just shaping it, that he's, he's going to be at work because I don't seem to get a really clear, definitive kind of this is, this is what I want you to say, kind of radio from heaven or whatever. Um, uh, and that's biblical. You know, the book of Esther, God is never explicitly mentioned, yet you can see his work all the time, right? Um, but on the other hand, there are also Sundays where God very clearly um, seems to tell me what I'm supposed to say, and uh, <laughs> this week was one of those weeks where as I was praying, uh, you know, Lord, what, uh, what do you want me to say? Show me what you want me to say. Then all of a sudden I read, comfort, comfort my people, says your God. You know, oh, <laughs> can't get a lot more obvious than that, can you? <laughs> so that's what we're talking about today, the, the comfort of God, and um, that's my desire to fulfill that that call of God to comfort you, his people. And in these two verses in Isaiah 40, um, I see seven reasons that God gives that we as his people can be comforted. And so we're just going to walk through them one by one. So the very first reason that God, that we, we have to be comforted, is that God actually desires your comfort. He says, comfort, comfort my people. The, if you care about grammar, the word comfort here is an imperative. That means it's a command. Like when you say to your dog, fetch or sit or roll over. God gives the command, comfort my people. And he doesn't give the command once, he gives it twice. He says, comfort, comfort. Meaning this is the high, high priority Above everything else, this is what I want you to do. I want you to comfort my people. Now, I don't know about you, um, but even though I have ample reason to believe that God actually desires my comfort, nevertheless, um, I tend to be more like, you know, the kid who just thinks, man, my parents just exist to ruin my life, and they just want to make me unhappy, and that's, that's, that's why they're there, right? Um, I th- for whatever reason, the unbelief of my heart, the way I'm wired, that is just that tends to be the way I default view God. That you know, He just He really just wants me to have a hard time, and He just kind of has something against me. But the opposite is true. God desires our comfort. He commands our comfort. Comfort, comfort my people. And. Um, he, you know, it's true. Okay, so God, he disciplines because he's a loving and wise father. And so he does discipline and discipline does not feel pleasant. He also knows that pain, struggles, trials have an ability to 
sanctify us, to make us more like Christ, or maybe even to wake us up and make us turn back to Christ. And so he does allow pain. He does allow hard things in our lives. But what's clear is that your pain is not his heart. His heart is that you would be comforted. He even says here, speak tenderly to Jerusalem. Now that Hebrew is literally speak to the heart. And at all the other places it's used in, in the Bible, this speak tenderly phrase, it's, it's when a man is either trying to woo a woman to get her hand in marriage or when he's trying to, a girl has run away and he's trying to get her back. And so here God's, you know, so it's, it's these comforting, it's these kind, it's these gentle words. And God again says, speak tenderly to Jerusalem. This is actually his desire, is that you would hear from him comforting, tender, kind words. And so we can be comforted just simply knowing that God desires your comfort. That's his will for you. That's reason number one. Reason number two, we can also be comforted because you are his people. You know, he says, comfort, comfort, my people. Comfort, comfort, my people. I'm not going to go into all the historic details about this, um, but I'll just let this suffice. You know, at the time when Isaiah says this, they were not being who they were supposed to be. Okay, they were, they were not being who they were supposed to be. God had said, you shall be holy for I am holy. They were not being holy. Yet nevertheless, God says to them, he calls them my people. That's the faithfulness of God. That he doesn't give up, he calls them my people. And I was reminded a, a couple weeks ago of a, an amazing passage in 2 Timothy where Paul says, if we've died with Christ, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. For he cannot deny himself. The faithfulness of God that he, he, he says to a nation of rebels, you are my people. He still says that today. And uh, just, I hope that strikes you. Because, you know, not everyone... Not everyone are the people of God. The majority of the world does not have that status. We, as Christians, as believers, are the people of God. And that is a high, high privilege. Um, God says in Deuteronomy, For you are a people holy to the Lord your God, and the Lord has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. A treasured possession. That is what he's called you as his people. That's open to everyone who believes. Then anyone is, is welcome, but it's only those who believe that are his people. But he does call you my people, my treasured possession. First Peter 2, it says, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And it says, once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. That is our state and our status. That is a, that is a very bright, dazzling reason to be comforted. That you belong to God. And that leads to reason number three. Not only do we belong to God... Not only are we his, he is ours. He says, comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Psalm 33 says, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. And in Isaiah 41, he says, fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you, I will help you, I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Then in verse 13 he says, For I, the Lord your God, hold your right hand. It is I who say to you, Fear not, for I am the one who helps you. You know, just as, like, as a husband is there to protect and provide for his wife, or a father is there to protect and provide for his children, God says, I am yours. I am your husband. I am your father. 
I am your protector, I'm your provider. And not only is, not only is he our protector and provider, he's also our prize. I was thinking about this, this is probably like the 12th time in three years I've quoted this, but I, I, I know it never gets old for me, so I have to just keep doing it. But Genesis 15, verse 1, God comes to Abram. He says, Abram, do not be afraid. I am your shield, your very great reward. Remember Abram, you know, God promises him. He says, Abram, I'm going to give you the promised land. I'm going to give you a great name. I'm going to give you offspring as numerous as the sand and the seashore and the stars and the heavens. I'm going to bless you and all the nations of the earth are going to be blessed through you. I'm going to give all of this to you. And then God caps it all off saying, and by the way, that all doesn't matter. Because really what I'm going to give you is myself. I am your very great reward. And that's not just for Abraham. That is for, Bible. the New Testament says, everyone who believes in the name of Jesus is a descendant, a child of Abraham, and has those promises. That if you believe in Jesus, God says to you, I, I, God, God of the whole universe, am yours, your very great reward. And so, God desires you to be comforted. You are his he is yours. Go to the fourth reason. He says, Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended. And there might be some here that, that can remember it, but I, for, I cannot imagine what it must have been like in, in 1945 when one day the announcement just comes, the war is over. It's done. <laughs> Our boys are coming home. No more, you know, air raid sirens. No more drills. No more this. They're coming home. The war is over. It's done. That must have been an amazing day. Well, God says to his people, your warfare is over. So the question is, what battle are you fighting? You know, Christians are not immune to suffering and all kinds of hard, horrible things in life. Whether it's losing people we love and mourning and loss and, and grief and bereavement, or whether it's anxieties and fears and guilt and shame, whether it's illnesses, whether it's just the desire to give up. We also know that we have a spiritual enemy, very powerful enemy, the devil, Right? And he, by accusations, by temptations, by, you know, throwing perverse thoughts into our mind, mental, spiritual afflictions, persecutions, and even sometimes, the Bible says this, sometimes physical attacks and physical illnesses can, not always, can come from him. In all these ways, the dragon makes war on God's people. And that's not being overly dramatic to call it war. It is war. You know, to resist temptation. So, you know, that's, that's lust or, you know, um, sexual acts beyond what God desires. Or whether that's greed. Whether it's spiritual apathy. Whatever it is, that's a hard fight. That's not easy to resist temptation. It's, it's wearying. It's oppressive. It's beating down. Or sometimes, you know, it's the barrage of accusations against you. What kind of Christian are you? You're no Christian. God's not going to save you. And it's like being in a siege city and he's trying to kill you by attrition as he just cuts off all resources and all hopeful words of grace from God. And so whether it's these other things or whether it's from the devil, we struggle. We, we suffer. That's, that's a reality as Christians. Yet God says to us, your warfare is ended. That's the comfort he gives. Your warfare is ended. Now someone says, what? <laughs> really? I, I don't know. <laughs> um, I still got all kinds of hard things in my life. I still got all kinds of bad things. And I got a long way to go, if the Lord tarries and if he gives me a long time. But how can you say, you know, that your warfare is ended? There's still a lot of hard things, a lot of bad things happening. Satan is still active, let me tell you that. How can you say your warfare is ended? In the Old Testament, Hebrew grammar, there's something called the prophetic perfect tense. 
For English speakers, it would make more sense to call it the prophetic past tense. Okay? What that is, is often the prophets will talk about something that has not occurred in history yet, but when they talk about it, they talk about it in the past tense. Why do they do that? Because it's so certain it is going to happen. God said it's going to happen, so it's going to happen. So they talk about it like it's already done. And so this verse here, for warfare is ended, that is a prophetic past tense. At the time Isaiah says this, I mean, Israel has barely started the first period of their wars. Okay? <laughs> they have not seen the worst of it. They still have, you know, a couple of victory, or a couple of victories, but some massive defeats coming their way. They have a long, hard battle coming up. It's not over. But Isaiah, by the Holy Spirit, says it's over. Because God says it's over. God says he's going to bring you through this, so it's already done. Your warfare is over. You see, that's where faith comes in. That's where we need faith. You know, Hebrews 11, famous verse. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for. Romans 8, Paul says, nobody hopes for something he already has. You hope for something you don't have right now. So Hebrews 11 says, faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. The power of faith is to look at something that hasn't happened yet and to see it's as good as done because God said it. And that is what God is saying to all his people. We are in the midst of warfare right now, factually. We are. We struggle in our lives. We've got all kinds of bad, sad things happening. But God says, your warfare is ended. It is the promise, I will bring you through it. It's over. Um, I have already overcome. Think about that verse we always read at Christmas Eve. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. We have received a Savior. I was thinking, again, I was thinking about to that, a savior. What's a savior? I think the best image we have in the Bible of what a savior is, is you remember the famous story, David and Goliath? Here, the whole Israelite army, right? And they're up against the Philistines. The Philistines are looking better. And then out comes Goliath. And he says, let's do it one-on-one. -on -one. And nobody's willing to fight Goliath until the savior, David, shows up. And he says, okay, I'll fight Goliath. And they go one-on-one. -on -one. David defeats Goliath, and so David single-handedly defeats the entire enemy. That is a precursor to Jesus Christ, the Savior, who shows up and single-handedly saves his people from all the warfare that the evil one makes against us. And so we have a Savior. 1 Corinthians 15 says, But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 16 says, the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. And so we still have battles, we still have hard times, we still have defeats ahead of us, but God's word is, you will stand, you will overcome through faith, and in that sense we can say your warfare is already over. And you can just rest in that, going, I know where I am going, I know where my fate is. It's over. It's done. You can rest in that. That's the fourth reason we can be comforted. Fifth reason that we're given is that your iniquity is pardoned. It says, comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Cry or speak tenderly to Jerusalem. Cry to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned. Brothers and sisters, your sins are forgiven. Okay? Christianity 101. Isaiah 53. I, I am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. Isaiah 44. I have blotted out your transgressions like a cloud, and your sins like a mist. Or one of the great images in Romans 8. You remember that? When uh, Paul says, you know, who can bring any charge against God's elect? You know, you kind of, I don't know if this is what he has in mind. In my mind, I have this vision of when everyone is gathered before the throne, 
all the angels, all the fallen angels, every human being who's ever existed, and they're all, we're all standing before the judgment throne. And, and Paul shouts out, of everyone here, every sentient being that's ever existed, who can bring a charge against God's elect, God's people? Who can, who can accuse anyone of God's people, of these sheep on the right? Point being, no one. There's not a single being there that can bring a charge. Why? Because your iniquity's already been pardoned in the past. It's already been done. Right? You know, if I, I, I didn't do this, but, uh, you know, let's say I was caught shoplifting when I was a teenager, and then I did my community service, and I, you know, basically got it taken care of. And then, uh, let's say I had to go to court for some other reason. They could never pull that up and say, well, you know, you did this. To, to, I mean, well, they could use it to inform it, but they could never penalize me. For that, because it's already been paid. Our sins have already been paid for by Christ on the cross. They cannot come against us again. Your iniquity is pardoned. And that leads us to our sixth reason for comfort. It says that you have received double. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem. Cry to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. What does that one mean? I'll give you this image, okay. Um, let's imagine you owe $100 million, okay? And uh, the person that you owe the $100 million to decides, you know what, we're just going to cancel the debt. How would you feel? <laughs> That'd be pretty good, right? You know? um, okay, well, that's the concept of a pardon. He just pardoned your debt. And that's huge. That's great. We need that. But to receive double is that person saying, yes, not only am I going to cancel that $100 million debt, I am now also going to give you an additional $100 million to live off of for the rest of your life. See, God, being pardoned is great, it's important, but it's, he doesn't just pardon. Receiving double from him receives, we don't just have God's pardon, it means we receive God's pleasure, too. And again, the image, I, I heard another preacher use this, I can't claim it, but I think, I think he gets the point across that, again, imagine someone goes to prison because they're a convicted murderer, and they go there for 20 years, but after 20 years, they're pardoned. They get to go free, they're, they're, they're out of prison. On the day that happens, I mean, man, they probably feel amazing. You know, I'm out of prison. I got my life back. I, I'm pardoned. I can go. But then what do you think their life is like when they go to apply for a job? And they're in the interview, and, and, and the manager says, so what's up with this 20-year uh, this, this gap in your resume? What were you doing during that time? Or he starts dating, and then the girls start asking, you know, about his past, and comes out that he's a convicted murderer. You know, that's, that's going to be a hard life, even if you're not in prison anymore, right? Because he's still, even though he's been pardoned, he's still viewed a certain way. That's not the case with God, okay? I know a lot of times, you know, a, a lot of people think that. They're just like, yeah, I know God's forgiven me, kind of because he has to. He's kind of under this legal obligation where he has to forgive me, but I don't think he likes me. I mean, I think he just kind of groans and goes, oh man, that guy again? But that's not the truth. The truth is God not only pardons, he takes pleasure in his people. I mean, that, that's what Jesus shows us in the prodigal son story. Remember the prodigal son gets his inheritance, goes out, wastes it all, lives a totally debaucherous life, is not kind to his father. Then when he's in the absolute depths, he, he thinks, man, maybe if I'm lucky, like if I'm lucky... I can go back and be a servant in my dad's house. Maybe, maybe he'll take me back as a servant. What happens? Goes back, and as soon as his father sees him, his, his, his dad, is, his, his compassion grows warm, and he, he runs out, and he embraces his son. He starts weeping, and he kisses his son. And, even, and he doesn't even let his son finish his talk about how unworthy he is. The, dad, the father just cuts him off and says, just go, go get a robe, go get a ring, go get shoes, go kill the calf. We got to throw a party and celebrate. Because my son is back. He was dead, but now he's alive. He was lost, but now he's found. You see, the father doesn't say, okay, fine, son, I'll take you back, but you're really going to have to earn it. He rejoices, he overwhelms, he bubbles up, he erupts to have it back. 
That is the image that Jesus gives us of God. When we as sinners come back beating our breasts and say, God, I am an unworthy sinner. God doesn't go, okay, yeah, I guess I, I made that covenant so I have to. He rejoices, he delights. Do you believe that, that God actually takes pleasure and delight in you? Psalm 149 says that. It says, the Lord takes pleasure in his people. Or Isaiah 62 says, as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. God takes pleasure in you. Be comforted to know that. Now our seventh last reason we can be comforted that all of this is a gift. Okay, it says, Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. Where does all the comfort come from? It comes from the hand of Yahweh. Your God gives it. You know, maybe as you hear about all this comfort, you know, your, your heart kind of jumps and you, you know, it, it sounds great, but then kind of falls and goes, yeah, but surely I will manage to blow this. I, you know, I won't, I won't attain this. I won't get this. It's not about earning. It's not about worthiness. It is a gift given from the Lord, from his hand. The reason we rejoice in Christmas is because that is the evidence that God is for us. That he sent himself, his own son, down into the world to, by his incarnation, by his death, by his life, death, resurrection, to bring all this comfort to us, to make this comfort our reality. Not to give us a chance of maybe one day getting this comfort. No, to bring the comfort. I, I hope this is not a blasphemous analogy so you know take it with a grain of salt but I mean you know just you know so the, the, the idea of Santa Claus right he descends down the chimney and, and, he, and he plunks the, 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 the present under the tree and it's just it's there it's in the house all the kid has to do is open it Jesus has descended down from heaven and has given the gift to you his people all this comfort he's given it to you and it is simply ours to receive by faith. The only difference is Santa has his naughty and nice list. Jesus says, I'm done with that thing. I'm just going to give it. He's, Jesus is way better than Santa, okay? Um, <laughs> but you see, all of this, the fact that God desires you to be comforted, that you are his, he is yours, your warfare is ended, your iniquity is pardoned, he's given you double for all your sins, all of this is his gift given in Christ to all who believe. So receive it as a gift. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you are the one who's given the command to comfort, comfort your people. And I have spoken according to my ability, but only you the God of life, the God of all comfort. Only you, by the Holy Spirit, can truly comfort your people in their hearts. So, Father, I want to ask now that you would use these two verses from Isaiah and this sermon to comfort your people in whatever way they need comfort. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. And let's stand and we'll sing our next hymn.